Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. I'm Rachel Wright, and in the early hours of Wednesday the 6th of March, these are our main stories. US voters cast their ballots in the largest one-day prize of the nomination calendar. France's president goes to Prague to look for support in his bid to aid Ukraine. President Biden tells Israel there are no excuses for not allowing more aid into Gaza. Also in this podcast... Kharkiv is our city. We want there to be life here, including a cultural life. After two years of near silence, the Kharkiv National Opera and Ballet is about to reopen underground. It's usually called Super Tuesday, the day when the shape of the race to be a candidate in the US presidential election becomes clear, even if the actual candidates aren't fully decided upon. This year, not so much. With both the candidates at the last election apparently cruising to victory, some are calling Super Tuesday, Snoozer Tuesday. As we recorded this podcast, voting was still continuing. We'll bring you the results in our next edition. But to get a taste of how things were going, I spoke to our correspondent, Gary O'Donoghue, in Richmond, Virginia. I certainly think this little corner of Richmond, Virginia, where I am in a polling station, that sort of apathy, if you like, is reflected in the numbers that the polling staff here tell me that they've just had around 15% of registered voters in this precinct coming into voting vote in one of the two primaries. They would have expected it around 40%, so a real significant dip in enthusiasm. We'll see if that's reflected across the country, but uh, certainly the sense in which these two contests are wrapped up already, which they wouldn't normally by this, be this, by this stage in the election, I think is having an impact. So what, if any, uh, are the main issues that people have been campaigning on? Well, there's been very little campaigning here, uh, very little sign of any kind of, you know, yard signs or billboards or anything like that. In fact, some of the polling officials uh, centrally have been bemoaning the fact that there's been very little awareness by the political parties. People here, they, I mean, I talked to a few Democrats just a moment ago, very concerned about Joe Biden's age. One said that Gaza was a drag on the ticket for the Democrats. So, while they're voting for their favoured candidate, they're not doing it with any great enthusiasm, certainly on the Democratic side. And of course, with Nikki Haley still in the race against Donald Trump, there is still a residue of people supporting her. And the big question, I think, after tonight is where does that support go? Does it just swing back behind Donald Trump? Or are these people that really don't want to see Donald Trump back in the White House and might become sort of independent voters in November, possibly even switch over to the Democrats? Kerry O'Donoghue in Virginia. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has said Ukraine's European allies must not be cowards. Speaking on a visit to Prague, Mr Macron reiterated support for a Czech initiative to replenish Ukraine's heavily depleted arsenal and repeated the need for what he called a strategic surge in support for Ukraine. Is it or is it not our war? Can we look away and let things unravel? I don't think so. I called for a strategic surge, and I stand by that fully. We need to be realistic about the situation that's unfolding in Europe and what we need to stand up for. That could include a Czech proposal to buy artillery shells from outside the European Union to be sent to Ukraine because Europe can't meet its needs. Our correspondent in Prague, Rob Cameron, told me more. Those remarks uh, in that uh, address after meeting um, President Pavel were really festooned um, with rhetorical flourishes. And in fact, uh, President Macron started the uh, visit to Prague um, with even more rhetorical flourishes when he addressed members of the French community gathered at Prague Castle before he sat down with President Pavel. And in that speech, uh, he said that uh, we're certainly approaching a time in Europe when we must not 
not be cowards. This is something I think very much that President Pavel uh, is a former military man and a former very senior figure in NATO. He is completely on board. Um, he agrees that this is not the time for cowardice and this is time to be bold and to stand together and not to limit ourselves, uh, limit the, the, the Western uh, powers uh, in their response to what's happening in Ukraine. So is there a sense that France and the Czech Republic are working together for a more interventionist approach to Ukraine? I think there is. I think it's fair to say that. Obviously, President Macron will be criticised for you know, grandstanding and, uh, and as you say, this, this very powerful rhetoric. But uh, there is really something behind it because France is now on board with this Czech proposal to obtain up to 800,000 artillery shells for Ukraine outside the European Union. President Macron has dropped opposition to EU money being used to buy shells from outside Europe. He even says that the EU's European Peace Facility, and that's a fund um, with a ceiling of 12 billion euros in it could be used uh, to support the Czech plan. So uh, he is, I think, putting his money where his mouth is. It's not just rhetoric. And I believe, you know, listening to his words and to the things that the French government, joining the Canadians, the Danes, the Belgians, the Dutch, the Lithuanians and others, are signing up to with this Czech initiative to get artillery ammunition to Ukraine. Rob Cameron in Prague. Now, despite that lack of ammunition, Ukraine has reported a big military success. It says it has sunk a Russian patrol ship in the Black Sea near annexed Crimea. It would add to the more than 20 Russian vessels Ukraine has destroyed since the full-scale invasion two years ago. This report from Abdul Jalil Abdurasilov in Kiev. Kiev claims that the attack took place near the Kerch Strait in the territorial waters of Ukraine. A video released by the Ukrainian military intelligence agency appears to show the moment when the ship was hit. It is thought five naval drones were involved in the attack that lasted for more than 40 minutes. Ukraine claims seven crew members were killed and six injured. Moscow's silence on this attack probably means one thing. The ship was destroyed. Separately, the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for two Russian senior commanders. They are accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity for allegedly directing airstrikes on civilian infrastructure in Ukraine. Abdijalil Abdurasilov in Kiev. President Biden has told Israel there are no excuses for not allowing more aid into Gaza. Israel's bombardment in the territory has led to widespread shortages of food, water and medicine. Speaking to reporters as he was about to board Air Force One, Mr Biden warned of serious consequences if there was no deal within the next week. The hostage deal is in the hands of Hamas right now okay. because there's been an offer, a rational offer. The Israelis have agreed to it and... Uh, Wait to see what the Hamas does. There's got to be a ceasefire because Ramadan, if we get into a circumstance where this continues through Ramadan, Israel and Jerusalem, again, it could be very, very dangerous. The president's call for a ceasefire comes as a senior member of Israel's war cabinet, Benny Gantz, was in Washington to meet U.S. leaders. Mr. Gantz is viewed as a big rival of the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Our correspondent in Jerusalem, Wira Davis, gave us this update. I think it's, it's far too early to, to even express hope that there will be a ceasefire because there's so much between the two sides even if they get around the table. At the minute Israel's even refusing to go uh, to Cairo because it says that Hamas hasn't provided this list, this definitive list of hostages who are still alive and would be released as part of a, of a swap with Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. But even assuming they do sit down in these indirect talks with mediators from the US, Qatar and Egypt, there are still some pretty big obstacles in the way. For example for example, Hamas would like Israeli troops to withdraw from Gaza and is insisting that Palestinians should be allowed to return to their home areas in northern Gaza in the event of, of a ceasefire. And I find those demands will be very difficult for Israel to agree to. So any, any hopes or any pressure from outside for a, a ceasefire agreement to be agreed before the start of Ramadan at the end of this weekend are still some way off. But as you're intimating, and as we heard there from Joe Biden, there is a lot of pressure particularly from the Americans, for some sort of breakthrough. 
We're at Davis in Jerusalem and we go next to next door Lebanon, where the course of true love never did run smooth, but those looking for the perfect partner in Lebanon may find themselves swiping right on a forbidden date. GPS in Lebanon has been disrupted so badly by the Israel-Hamas war that it is matching users in Beirut with potential dates in neighbouring Israel, which is not allowed under Lebanese law. Neda Mokoran is a journalist in Lebanon who looked at this for the national news site and spoke to the BBC's Evan Davis. It is actually so what's called GPS jamming. It's a warfare t- tactic that's used by a country to disrupt the enemy's attacks. They are relying on GPS, such as missiles, drones, that relies on, on GPS. And so basically it tricked the GPS location into putting another location so Israel has actually admitted to increases, increasing GPS jamming in the region. So it's quite baffling when you think that you have two countries that are enemies and it's it, that their citizens are, are swiping uh, next to each other on, on dating apps. This is the strange thing. So essentially, Israel is trying to disguise the position of its troops in the northern part and the confusion that they're spreading for their troops hits the dating apps as well. Yeah, exactly. So it is the dating apps, but you can imagine that it's not just the dating apps. It's basically any application that uses the user's location. So for instance, when I was traveling in South Lebanon, the GPS was so bad that it would put me in Beirut, it would put me in in the sea, it would put me in Israel. It has a very weird impact for like just Lebanese, especially also because for Lebanese, it is actually forbidden to have any kind of contacts with Israelis. Hang on, did you just say that in Lebanon, you're not allowed to have contact with Israelis? Yeah, not even like talk to them, so not swipe on them. So that would be something completely forbidden because no, Israel and and Lebanon are on the brink of a war. But as you say, Nata, what's absolutely fascinating here is that essentially two countries that are in a, a kind of very fragile, tense state with each other, the citizens, if they happen to be using these apps, are getting exposure to the other side. They're seeing the interests, the photos of um, Israelis, Lebanese, the people that they're not really interested in or not meant to be interested in. It's extremely yeah, baffling and, and surprising when you when you find like so many Israeli profiles. It has triggered some uh, theories in Lebanon that there might be Mossad spies trying to get information. Uh, I also saw people being quite angry at it and saying that they're not using the apps anymore because there's no use in it. I just wonder whether it does promote a bit of understanding. I mean, across the border, you do basically see that the other people are not that different to you. They're just on an app trying to find somebody. I think like some people have these very romantic ideas of forbidden love, but other, I think, would be still uh, quite annoyed of, you know, seeing so many profiles that they're uh, deemed as, like, belonging to the enemy. Neda Mokaran. Still to come on this podcast, there are fears for the long-eared owls of northeast Serbia after the worst mass poisoning of birds ever recorded. They were standing up in the trees, behaving really strange and just falling down. The damage is huge. It's going to hit the population of long-eared owl, common kestrel and red-footed falcon heavily. Timeless stories, exceptional storytellers. Discover all your favourite BBC radio dramas available to enjoy as audiobooks. John Moffat stars in Poirot's Finest Cases, a collection of gripping full-cast dramatisations based on the novels by Agatha Christie. And what would be your ideal murder mystery, Poirot? A very simple crime. A crime with no complications. A crime that was unimpassioned and team. Search for BBC Audio wherever you purchase audiobooks and start listening. What stories would you like to share with your daughter? What does she need to know to help her navigate her life ahead? Dear Daughter is the award-winning podcast from the BBC World Service, full of thoughtful letters of advice, personal stories, and life lessons for daughters everywhere. And it's back for a new series with more of your letters and more fantastic guests. Search for Dear Daughter wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Dear Daughter. 
Welcome back to the Global News Podcast. Now to Italy, where 97 migrants have been airlifted from Libya in an unprecedented evacuation. A crowd welcomed the group, which includes 55 women and 27 children. Over the next three years, 1,500 refugees will be jetting off on the same journey under arrangements brought in by the Italian government in December. The UNHCR carried out the evacuation and said those arriving were victims of trafficking, people who have survived violence and torture and those with serious health conditions. A spokesperson from the agency greeted the rivals. We need many more of these flights. They are life-saving. They help people with extreme vulnerabilities to be able to come to our country. And we are at their side and we're grateful to all those who made it possible. But not everyone will share that view. The Prime Minister, Giorgia Meloni, had previously promised Italy would not become Europe's refugee camp. So why the gear change? I've been speaking to Davide Giglioni from the BBC's Rome Bureau. This is quite significant and I think it surprised the many people because when she wanted to be elected, when Giorgia Meloni was campaigning, she was very openly against migration uh, and she was perceived as anti-immigrant. But now, very silently, I would say, this protocol was signed with UNHCR and other NGOs on the ground to bring legal migrants into the country. Obviously, we do know that there's a, an ageing population problem in Italy, not only in Italy, Northern Europe, in other countries, in the UK as well. So there is the need to find solutions to bring people in to work and live within the European Union, in the UK. But that's a very, very big political issue because obviously this is becoming a huge problem considering the, the current numbers of people trying to cross the Mediterranean or people trying to cross into the UK from France, crossing the Channel. So this is very hard for politicians to tell their base and the voters that they're also bringing migrants in in a legal way. The group has just arrived. Which countries do they come from? So they come from several countries. Um, in Africa, most of them come from Sudan. We obviously know that uh, Sudan is a country which has been ravaged by war. Um, there's more. Since the 15th of April, there have been more than 8 million displaced there. So clearly, this is just a drop in the ocean. But it, I think it's really significant because this is showing how it's necessary to act urgently to find legal pathways for people to apply for asylum elsewhere, essentially. What will happen to them now, now that they're in Italy? So it really depends uh, on, on, on the age, uh, on the, the health, uh, if the women, if the children, if they're disabled, but there will be a formal process for them to be put into the, the we, we call it Sistema di Accoglienza in Italian, which is basically uh, the system to welcome asylum seekers. So they'll be part of that. And we do know that the aim is to bring more people over the coming years. Davide Giglioni. The European Union has reached a provisional deal to ban single-use plastics by the end of the decade. It still needs final approval from the Parliament and from EU member governments. Cyrus Endura is a member of the European Parliament for Malta, who's on the EU Parliament's Climate Committee. He spoke to Nuala McGovern about the new rules. It's not enough, but if we do nothing, plastic packaging waste was expected to increase by 46% by the year 2030. So something had to be done. Uh, as a European Parliament, we wanted a more ambitious uh, legislation. The European Commission had proposed a more ambitious legislation, but member states tried to water this down. We managed to get a final agreement between the different um, institutions of the European Union on what law will be agreed to uh, in the end of this quite long process, actually. And can you tell us concretely what will be banned? Give me an example or examples. Yeah. So one example would be the small shampoo and soap bottles in hotels, for instance, mm. where rather than having small um, individual uh, 
uh, shampoo bottles, we will go to disposable, uh, the, the non-disposable big ones uh, where you use uh, the same bottle. If we could speak of other toiletry products in hotels, for instance, lightweight plastic bags in supermarkets or else the you know the small sachets for sauces and condiments in restaurants all of those will be banned from that day onwards. There was a lot of lobbying apparently incredibly intense uh, around even to get to this compromise that you have at the moment and some lobbying groups were saying that it was discriminating against specific packaging formats particularly those that are already able to be recycled and Doing that would discourage the sustained development of green technologies, perhaps even talking about those small packets that we can get that are made of paper, uh, whether it was for salt or pepper or something along those lines. The European Commission for a number of years was moving towards the recycling targets. Unfortunately, the vast majority of member states, including mine, Malta, never um, reached our objectives and targets when it came to recycling. It was for those reasons that the European Commission uh, decided to move away from uh, recycling targets and instead having more reuse targets. And when we speak, for instance, I mentioned shampoo bottles, the small ones in hotels, rather than recycling all of those small bottles, we'll move towards reusing the same uh, bottle. It's the same thing when it comes to sugar sachets or sauce sachets in restaurants. Rather than having the small ones and having them made of material that could be recycled, let's move on to a reusable system where we remember the past when I was younger, uh, the system was you would have a big bottle of ketchup and you use that and that is reused um, in, in the restaurant. Cyrus Endura from the European Parliament's Climate Committee. Scientists have for the first time successfully used stem cells taken from late-stage human pregnancy to grow mini-organs, raising the possibility of treating congenital conditions before birth. Researchers in London have developed a safe way to extract stem cells that had passed into the amniotic fluid that surrounds the fetus. Professor Paolo Di Coppi is one of the researchers involved and told us how the new technology works. We can derive stem cells from the amniotic fluid that surround the fetus. And these stem cells are able to make mini organ. These are tissue-specific stem cells. So they are already committed to an organ. We knew that cells coming from the fetus were present in the amniotic fluid, but we didn't know the stem cells derive specifically from the lung, from the intestine, and from the kidneys of the fetus. The beauty of this is that we are able to extract cells from the fetus without uh, any uh, termination of pregnancy. These cells uh, can replicate some of the features uh, of the organ itself. And particularly, we are referring to the inner layer of the organ, so the epithelium. We studied one disease that is a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. A difficult term, but essentially is when you're missing the diaphragm which separate the abdomen from the lung. In one in 4,000 newborn baby, you have this uh, condition in which the organ of the abdomen come up into the chest and press on the developing lung. The lung uh, is hypoplastic, so essentially does not develop, and 30% of these fetus do not survive. So uh, personalized medicine of the fetus, if you wish. Professor Paolo Di Coppi. Authorities in Serbia are investigating what ornithologists are calling the worst mass poisoning of birds ever recorded in the region. The affected area near Kikinda in the northeast of the country is internationally renowned for its population of long-eared owls. Our Balkans correspondent Guy Delaunay sent this report. <coughs> Birdwatchers call Kikinda the world capital of long-eared owls. Every winter, hundreds of the distinctive tufty-eared birds of prey roost in the trees around the square of this small Serbian town. 
As well as offering ornithologist eye candy, the owls also provide a valuable service to nearby farmers. By some estimates, they devour as many as half a million crop-munching rodents over the winter months. But wildlife activists say that's now under threat, following the deaths of almost 1,000 birds near Kikinda in recent days. Not owls, but rooks and jackdaws. They're locally protected species which are vital to birds of prey, making the nests the owls rely on. Milan Ruzic of Serbia's Bird Protection and Study Society went to investigate reports of dead birds. We could actually see the birds dying right in front of our eyes because they were standing up in the trees, behaving really strange and just falling down. The damage is huge. The loss of 800 quarters in the area is going to hit the population of long-eared owl, common kestrel and red-footed falcon heavily. Mr Ruzic believes that frustration with crop damage by rodents has led someone to spread poisoned seeds as a form of pest control, but the rooks and jackdaws took the bait instead. That's still to be confirmed by the authorities, who are now analysing the birds to identify the precise cause of death. But without the rooks' nests, the long-eared owls will have fewer homes in Kikinda, and they may simply fly elsewhere next winter. That report by Guy Delaunay. In the United States, people are now living further and further away from the city centre. A new study has revealed that many Americans now live roughly twice as far from their offices as they did pre-pandemic. This is according to economists at Stanford and Gusto, a payroll provider. Rahul Tandon spoke to Richard Florida, author of The New Urban Crisis and professor of economic analysis and policy at the University of Toronto. At the beginning of the pandemic, there was a prediction that people would leave big cities and move far away to Zoom towns, Miami Beach, Austin, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, or Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or Bozeman, Montana. But what's really happened instead is that the suburban ring or that exurban ring outside of cities has gotten larger and larger, and people have kind of jumped outside the suburban ring to these kind of rural communities at the really the exurban fringe. So I think that's that's the big takeaway, that America has always been the land of sprawl, and uh, remote work has made us sprawlier. <laughs> there are a lot of people who have moved, haven't they, out of state, but... Why are we seeing more of this phenomenon that you're describing? Why aren't they going to Florida? Why aren't they going to the beaches? Well, I think because it's really not work from home. It's hybrid work. And I think that's what we've seen. It's it's not that employers are letting people completely off the hook. You know, they want they want people to come in, say, a day a week or more likely two or three days a week. And that's a little bit doable, especially if you're commuting once a week or once every other week from the suburban fringe. It's a lot harder to do. In, in fact, what we've been seeing, I think, is that a lot of the people who move to different metropolitan areas, from New York to Florida, from San Francisco to Austin, that once their remote job dries up, it's hard to get another one. So a lot of those folks end up going back, you know, if they did finance or real estate, they go back to New York. If they did high tech, they go back to San Francisco. And there's one additional fact, about 60% of all moves during the pandemic were in the same metro. And about 75% of them were in the same county. So most people are not moving far, far away. They're moving a little bit further. And, you know, in in the States, we have a moniker we use for this when, when you think about people trying to buy a house and housing has become, I mean, one thing the pandemic did was drive up the cost of housing or make housing more unaffordable because people wanted out of a condo or an apartment. They wanted more space. And the phrase is called drive till you qualify. Just think about that. Drive your car till you qualify for a mortgage because housing costs get a little bit lower the further and further you go from the city center. And I think that's really explains it all. What Americans are doing are driving till they qualify for housing. Professor Richard Florida. Now, if you want to go to a concert in Kharkiv these days, you have to know who to ask. Ukraine's second city is just 40 kilometres from the Russian border and all mass gatherings have been banned since the start of the full-scale invasion. 